<laughs> oh, you have already? Oh, no, oh, no, no, Peter's. Peter's and I said Swenson, sorry. <laughs> um, and I would ask Peggy, the sister, to introduce to us. Yeah. Very happy to. Um, so, Andrew's one of my brothers, I have a couple other brothers, and seven sisters, so. <laughs> so he's got lots of critics right off the bat. Um, and so we've always, in our family, we've always had lots of really interesting conversations.
lot of companies reward people who are the most unscrupulous and make them CEOs and <laughs> because they can drive the biggest profit. But Thornton is the main character. He doesn't see, well, he sees where that trail goes, and he works nonstop to set a different course. And it's kind of odd because you could, every one of us, can be that pebble thrown into the pond that ripples out amongst those around us to be good, bad, or whatever. If they admire how you are, then you can influence those to be preferably, obviously, good. But the, the, the conflict arises when others who have their own agenda try to recruit him to serve their purpose. And he is steadfast in what he is and why he is the way he is. Paradoxically, this person who was agnostic and Thank you for coming. looked down upon religion becomes believed to be a prophet because of his self not never ending selfless acts of of helping people to be improve their lives. And his level of dedication to this philosophy is so profound that he endures, for those of you who read the book, um, in just strife, profound strife. And he still continues on his mission, which is to use the time he has as the temporary custodians of the molecules that create us, back to that, to make the best of, to chart a course for humanity. And it's, I know it sounds really lofty, but it's packaged into a story that is just, it's, you can read it, you can choose to read it as what's going on here, or you can just look at it as a story for what it is and appreciate, hopefully appreciate just the story itself, but it was developed with the idea of, of being um, thought provoking so that when you put it down you're thinking about a lot more than just the characters, but rather what the message of the book is. I hate to give any <laughs> credit to someone I'm not very fond of, but I know a lot of people hold up Ayn Rand and go, this is, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it's fiction, you know, it's it's not a it's not a, a factual story, it's not based on any history, it's just fiction. And to that end, I can write a fictional story. <laughs> so if if anyone has read it, um, I I would open it up now to Ask. I know Marilyn. You said you might add some questions on on things if if you wanted to. Yes, I suggest it become a movie with Ben Affleck <laughs> as the main character. I could just see him right there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll call that. Oh, well, that that's uh, that would work for me. <laughs> um, but uh, I I guess I'm. If I dare go into a passage that I might want that might kind of convey some of that. And oh, I, I forgot my cheaters on the way here, so I uh, picked up some really pretty cheaters. I didn't realize they were so pretty, and I still got the label on them.
Aziz Jalou was a changed man since his descent into living underground. He had lost weight from an already thin form, and in a desperate effort to alter his appearance, shaved off his eyebrows along with wearing a more traditional garb to blend in with the fundamentalists in the community. He had run out of money and charity and was now reduced to stealing from fruit stands using the same tactics as the poor children in the market square. He had tasted the respect that came with being a leader in the community and now understood the stark contrast of living life on the run. It was during one of these moments on an especially hot day when he saw, in the distance, the familiar form of Thornton Klein kneeling down beside an old woman who was under the shade of a small tree. It appeared that she had been overcome by the intense heat of the day and he was administering some assistance by giving her his own water supply and helping her cool off. Breeze's first thought was to move briskly away before he was recognized, but he had reached a new level of desperation and instead began walking toward Dr. Klein. As he got closer, he saw the old woman rise to her feet and thank the doctor for his help before continuing on her way. Thornton stood watching her hobble slowly on before turning around to once again come face to face with Marines. Only this time the situation was reversed. Now it was Thornton who was frightened of being seen with Marines and not the other way around. When their eyes met, Thornton paused at the sight of his former friend and stood staring at the transformation standing before him. It seemed like an eternity, but it was actually perhaps only five seconds before Thornton's medical instincts kicked in and he grabbed Harris to sit him down under the same tree where he had just treated the elderly woman. Harris looked up and began to speak, but Thornton cut him short, saying, Wait. It was clear from his that his former liaison was malnourished and dehydrated, so Thornton reached into his bag and handed Harris a mixture of figs and dates that he had just purchased from one of the vendors, saying, Eat these. I will be right back. Wasting no time, he stepped over to the closest merchant selling fruit juices, and returned with a watered-down grape mixture before handing that to Mr. Jalou as well. Marie's needed the nourishment, but, was, but it was very difficult to accept charity from a man he knew he had hurt so deeply. After he drank the juice and finished chewing the handful of figs that had given him, he looked up and thanked him repeatedly. Once again, he had been overwhelmed by the kindness and generosity of a man who once had considered a naive and lofty-minded infidel. Thornton sat down next to him in the shade of the tree, allowing Harris to absorb the nutrients and collect himself. Once Harris finished drinking the last drop of juice, he sat looking off in the distance, too ashamed to make eye contact, while Thornton sat quietly alongside him. After a long and awkward silence, Harris said, I don't know how it came to this. I live and work in a community of people that I love and care about, and I see them suffering at the hands of the Zionists, so I decide I must do something. Thornton could see in his face the pain and effort of retracing the path to his demise, and allowed him long pauses to gather the will to continue. Harris finally so summoned the determination to go on, adding, So I gather with the other men after prayer and ask, How can I help? What can I do for my people? I thought I was doing the right thing, the good thing, striking out against our enemies, but somewhere along the way, the clear line between right and wrong became blurry. By now his voice had begun to crack and tears poured down his cheeks. He did not sob but continued speaking without wiping them away, still staring off in the distance and unable to look Thornton in the eye. He began to tremble as he went on set to say, I've done such horrible things. I deserve whatever punishment I attain. It'll be a relief to answer for the sins I've committed. Then he looked down at the ground beneath him and made two fists as if he was mustering up the strength for one big push. He raised his head, locking eyes with Thornton, and said, I led the suicide bomber to the cafe when your wife would have lunch that day. Thornton never broke the stare, but reciprocated the intensity of the moment. And as the two remained fixed in their gaze, <clears throat> Thornton simply replied, was the one response for which Harris was completely unprepared. It took time for it to sink in. Harris had expected that perhaps Thornton would rise to his feet and beat him to death, or summon the police, or even begin weeping uncontrollably, but to sit with him and give him food and comfort. When, when most fled, rather than be seen with this wanted criminal, 
all the while knowing he helped take away the most important thing in his life, was beyond Harise's ability to comprehend. The response from Thornton hit Harise harder than any reaction he could have anticipated. His face contorted in painful confusion as he sat looking at the man who seemed to possess some kind of supernatural power of forgiveness. Harise had always been a deeply religious man, and now he was sat in the presence of a person who seemed to have taken on the aura of a holy prophet. A selfless giver that spent his life helping those who were doing harm with the same level of compassion as he would a stranger or a close friend. He actually seemed to possess the virtues espoused by all three of the major religions of this land. It only worsened his feelings of guilt as he grabbed Thornton tightly by the arm and said, asking him for me. I will comply. Thornton could see the level of desperation in Harith's eyes. <clears throat> he took a moment to measure the sincerity of his request, and he replied, Be a good man. Do what you know is right. Use your experience to help others so they are not taken in by those who want to continue this endless violence. You have come to know how alluring the path of revenge can be, but you also understand where revenge really leads. Help other, others learn from your experience and not repeat those mistakes. All people everywhere want the same thing, and history has proven that retribution will not take us there. You say, ask anything of me? I ask this. Use your time in this world to make use your time to make the world a better place. Not for a for your perceived tribe, but for all walks of life. That should be your objective. We are all living in an era that will pass one way or another. We can shape the direction of the future. And on, the only way to do so that so that it becomes the kind of world we want is to transcend this endless conflict. Pass along this rationale to everyone you can. Use reason and empathy as your tools to help others make the conversion toward peace. Challenge those who use violence to further their cause to consider more effective ways of reaching their goals rather than giving perceived enemies an excuse to cause you harm or revenge. If this idea could take hold, if enough people could join in, we could achieve such a reason. Breeze sat in silence as he contemplated with the guidance, until Thornton stood up and said, I'm not going to turn on you. But I can't be seen talking to you the way things are now. Use the time you have wisely. Then he added, this isn't about forgiveness or retribution. It's about changing destructive behavior. I can see you have come to appreciate the pain your actions have caused, and that's all I can hope for, for any kind of resolution in this tragic cycle. Then he turned away and continued on. As Thornton faded from view, Marie sat contemplating the way Thornton Fort Pine had made him re-examine his methods and deeds. Before this moment, life had held very little nuance. There were good people and bad people, and the bad people had to be vanquished. But Thornton didn't fit neatly into this worldview, and it forced him to rethink his own understanding of everything. In the past, when he saw or learned a violent act carried out at the hands of one of his disciples, that oftentimes he himself had recruited, he would dismiss the tragic event as a necessary means to an end. But Thornton made him see that that end would never come, and in the meantime he was committing even more horrific acts in a futile effort to achieve such a peace, to achieve a peaceful future. Greece had never seen another way until her, until the day Thornton showed up with the prosthetic limbs for Khabib's now deceased oldest son. The fact that Thornton knew that Harise had been responsible for the death of his wife, and still had the, that kind of compassion for him, sent Harise into a into a place of complete uncertainty about what he was doing in the fight for his cause. If he had been wrong, then the sudden realization of all the horrible acts he had been involved with was more than he could live with. That's just that. <laughs> but that kind of conveys the thing of, of a agnostic man doing altruistic tasks or things to help improve humanity. And in, if you read on, it, <laughs> he develops quite a following. And it's, it's just an in interesting juxtaposition because people project onto him <clears throat> that 
qualities or the aura of being a, a prophet. When he doesn't view the world that way, he just wants what's best. It doesn't... I wanted to be really careful not to, not to tell people what is what happened or, or how things are. It's left up to you. So if you if you want to read into it that there is a higher power at work, there's a lot to draw, there's a lot of material in the book that will, could lead you to believe that. But if you wanted to look at it like it's science and logic, it's it's your choice. I've never done this is my very first meet the author thing. Yeah. And it's really awesome to be here and I'm Thank you, Marilyn, so much for making this happen. So you're my guinea pigs, and I hope uh, I hope I did this. I don't know. You've seen a few of these come through. Yeah, I, I guess I think. And Marilyn, you said you had some thoughts to share about the book, and I think one of the things that we talked about a little bit was uh, we don't for people who haven't read it yet. They will discover the story as they go through it, but I, I think it's really neat to hear people's reactions. But, mm -hmm. David, Marilyn, do you want to start? And talk about well, that? just that it's a haunting ending. A haunting? Surprise. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And also, when we were corresponding by email, you suggested that I um, get a book from Lulu Publishing. Oh, and I want you to tell right. folks about how I got an individualized published book. That, that's it's yeah. Because you're very special. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. Right. They, they but this said, is something new this in the Maryland? publishing world. We yes. need to print one out for Maryland. No, the, um, when I, because I'm I'm a novice across the board. Can I back up to when, where did, where did the story come from in your head and the evolution to getting. It out of your head right. and paper and then to publication. That's, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, the first first step was YouTube. Because I, I had a, the, the manuscript, which was laughably crude and riddled with typos and I call it chimney writing because my, I don't do paragraphs, it was like a freeform <laughs> thought. And I just put it all on, on the paper and and then refined it, and uh, the refining took a lot more longer than, than the writing. But the, what I did then was I looked into self-publishing just by doing Google but YouTube searches, and the one that came to mind or showed up the most was Lulu self-publishing. Go to the website, and you can if you don't have the, the anything to work with. You can just use their tools, and I did. For the, the font, I kept picking different fonts. The, the structure on the back, it's all like uh, the Wix websites where you just drag and drop your PDFs and, and the, your images. This picture I took with my with this camera through my windshield on the drive into work. <laughs> wow! So not that it's a great, but it was just. And then just centered it, and I mean, so it was completely, I didn't even talk to another human being to make the book. Um, eventually I did, because when I was ready to go, and, and officially, then I started working with some people, but um, this is exactly what I, this, all this, and, and that, and even the, the ISBN number and everything, without ever speaking to another person. You are thinking about writing the book. It's it's an incredible way to go. Um, if you did the old way before self-publishing became so easy, you would submit your manuscript and be rejected and rejected and rejected, and then maybe you'd get a hit. But if you did get a hit, you would get such a fraction of of the sale of the book. And to be honest, it's still a, a fraction. But you have Full control, and I would strongly recommend uh, Lulu. There's a few other ones, but um, it's it's really easy to do, and that doesn't stop you from being able to. I was just telling Marilyn, 
Fifty Shades of Grey was initially published on Lou. <laughs> and then it was picked up, as, as many of those books are, by uh, a major publisher. And then, and then things really open up, but they have to invest in all the, I mean, the flying around the country and all the promos that are involved with that. But um, it's really, it was really fun, even though, you know, I don't expect to hit, hit the jackpot financially. Um, it's, it's just fun to, to have done all this, and anyone can do it. And not just that, but it has been submitted to Hollywood. You know, they have a, I'm sure it's in a very big pile of <laughs> submissions, but there is a, the chance someone could rifle through and go, oh, what's this? And the Hollywood machine never stops going, so. story was in your head and, um, and kind of that, that evolution even before you were putting it down on paper. Get yeah, how did that get I in mean, your head? Oh, well, <laughs> when did that you know what? And then how? You know, this is, it's, it's really tricky and I'm modifying my presentation in a way I didn't want to, but I, but I will because this is an intimate gathering and everything. But um, I wrote the story backwards. Um, I had the ending. And I didn't have, and you know the ending, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like, how do I arrive at that ending? And uh, and then, uh, but I wanted to create the char the main character that everyone could, that would draw you in, and um, so it's it was just a a hodgepodge of like the the names and everything I I um, say like uh, the main the main oh, Thornton is like a mediator between two rival factions. Harris Jalou is the uh, Palestinian, and uh, David Haber is the Jewish Mossad officer. <clears throat> and I ha had to research names to find the names that would. <laughs> that would be authentic, that would trace back to, if somebody was, okay, for example, um, the Django Unchained, um, people saw that and they go, what, dynamite wasn't invented yet? And then the, then the Klux Klan, they're going, they didn't exist yet, you know, and all the people, all the fact finders are like, what is this? This is just crazy. And I didn't want anybody to do that with this book, <laughs> so I spent a crazy amount of time uh, researching the names that would go back that far. Um, I remember Julie caught the cuisine that I had at one of the meals was wrong. Um, the uh, Turkish uh, <laughs> contact was had the. She's just. I have a. I have a sister that's. Oh, Off the charts, library. yeah. <laughs> she's she's Rain Man, <laughs> and uh, it's not she, me. It's yeah, she, sister. <laughs> she caught little things that you'd never think, but but um, so it was the amount of refinement took longer than writing the story itself. One of the things when I the first time I read through it, and and for those of you who are reading it or have read it, it's a very there's no pictures in the book, but it's very visual. It and is. When I was yeah. 20 years old, I went to Palestine and lived there for six weeks and went walking at the Pools of Solomon. So I'm reading this and I, I went to many of the places that are that you go to in this mm -hmm. book. And so I'm having these pictures like, he nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. And uh, so that was spooky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was one of my questions? Was you whether you had actually gone... To visit or to experience that area because it is, it's like, wow, he had to have been there to... Yeah, I walked those three pools of Solomon, yeah. you know, and, and the different places that he's talking about. And yeah, it's so... So you had not. Easy. This was just no, through no, research. I, but, wow. But I am a, a, a junkie <laughs> for history. And, yeah. And that's, and that's how, like, I blended in um, the science of anthropology and and religion and it, it's 
there's so many, there's, it draws from the, the I, I always have to give credit to Neil deGrasse Tyson and the Cosmos because there's people who view life um, through the lens of religion and then there's people who view lens through the life of science and Thornton is so scientific that he's trying to, he wants to understand how it, how it came to, to pass that these, this conflict even exists when they're all the same people, when we are all the same people. But especially in regions where uh, the, uh, the life started by anthropologist standards in Africa and then worked its way up, you know, some went east and they believe that they went up through. Uh, yeah, well, yep, and then up through like China and then over into, well, where Russia meets Alaska, and those people came down, American Indians, and uh, South, South Americans, and Inuits are all of the same strand. There's been, it's really hard for me not to get easily off on a tangent because I just live for this stuff where they do DNA swabs of people to find out why there's blue-eyed African Americans. And they find out, well, they're, they're from Europe, <laughs> not Africa. And it's, but all this, the thing about it is our differences are artificial and self, we create them. Whether it's, you know, we, we say this is our culture, but it's our culture because we have drafted our culture. We've, we've, <laughs> we've, we've embraced cultures that we choose to embrace. My favorite quote <laughs> is, well, I've got a few. Judge Judy, uh, you know, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. No. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Seuss, <laughs> with the brain in my head and feet in my shoes, I can walk in whichever direction I choose. And the reason I like that one so much is because people choose to say, I am this, and therefore, I'm on that team and I embrace their values, and I'm not going to consider this other person's values. And Thornton can't wrap his brain around that for me, main character, and so he's constantly goes through life trying to understand why people are treating each other the way they are when it's not logical he sees he sees the picture of humanity as a cause that we all need to join together and work to fix because we could have the heaven or better life now, if we chose to, rather than project it into an afterlife, which we which may or may not be real, but <laughs> we have the power to do it here and now, or at least make the best of our time here. And he's that's his mission, um, and that's that's kind of I guess that's sort of like the fuel. For the story, but I really hope that even if you didn't view it that way, and all you did was just look at the story, that you'd go, wow, that's a cool story. Mm -hmm. so. But it's like, he does state in there, though, that I don't know, I can't remember where he was, if he was being interrogated by the police or whatever, mm -hmm. that if you look back, the heritage, you're all the same people who speak to the book that Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, that was really interesting. So why are you fighting? Right. What are your differences? Which, which, to him, which rumors you chose to believe and, and which you didn't. And, and then also pointing out that um, Moses and Zipporah was a mixed marriage. Mary and Joseph was a mixed marriage. And yet we have, there's a, there's, it's in place that if by some books, if the mother is Jewish and the father isn't, the child will be Jewish or not, depending on which 
depending on what you choose, <laughs> what you choose to believe. So it's all just a, a and this is really, I, I realize that this is some controversial business, but it's, it is what, it's not, it is true. <laughs> so, and it's, it's, we, we manufactured that by referencing scripture and, and then, I'm not, I don't want to come off as, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend anyone. I just wanted it to, to be thought provoking. And so it's, it's really hard to walk that tightrope, but I think I did, especially with the two rival factions, because if people were offended, I would question if they read the book. You know, if, if mm -hmm. I if I did get blowback for this being, you know, because it's a delicate subject, but I did thread the needle, I think, without because it's it's I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm not saying even, even any side's right or wrong. I'm just saying here's the situation we're in. Here's a guy, yeah, and here's a guy who wants to make it better without mm -hmm. saying. He you're really passionate about your, your character. I'm curious if that came from building him or if you're using him to get your message out. Mm. Mm. I've had people ask me, go, so are you flirting you know, yeah. I've had people ask me that. And, I said, and my answer to that is no, I'm not nearly intelligent enough to be him. <laughs> Just to write him. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can write him, but I can't, uh, I, couldn't be, I couldn't be a medical doctor or, you know, things that he's, that he grasps and stuff, but, yeah, that's... There's a simplicity to, to his own value system that's, that's, uh, you know, carries through, it's very complex situations, but he, his values are so simple, and that he's, he's able to stick to them, I think, without, he's, without shifting with these forces, um, because they're, they're simple and clear. It's that, that scientific and logical approach to, you know, what are, what's going on and what is the, what's the outcome? What's the cause and effect? If we behave this way, this is going to be the outcome. Um, if you keep behaving, you know, with having the, the conflict and the violence, there's just going to be more of it. And that's kind of the science of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the logic of it. And the word there is to transcend it. Because... Yeah. You can do the payback and payback, and, yeah. and, you, and then you'll keep doing that. Yeah, or you can you can just say let's let's just agree to to work this out, or to just agree that the payback's not going to get us where we want to go. Yeah. But one of the things I I like to really drive home about the book is that he was sought out by Galit, and she is from. The Middle East, and the question is: Was was she was was she logically seeking him out, or was there a higher power at work when she yeah, finds him? Yeah. Is it never really solved? Yeah, is right. Never Fate? Really is it destiny, or is it design? How did yeah. she find him, or how did <laughs> Well, I thank you all very much. I think. Uh, if I go any longer, I'll probably just uh, do this. <laughs> so I'll just uh, stop there and, and thank you for your time. I hope you really enjoy it. Thank, thank you for, for coming. coming. Yeah. Yeah. It's intriguing. Yeah. I might have to break down and read it. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Once you start, it's not going to take very long. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is kind of the layers of the story. Um, it's, there's a beautiful love story. And there's these philosophical things to, to sort through throughout the book. So reading it one time is good, and then when you go back and, and read through, then you can actually read the same book and that's, be reading a completely different book. That's <laughs> why I said the second read is because of all the things that, the, I call them breadcrumbs, mm -hmm. that were laid out in the first pass. And if you read it again, you'll be like, oh my gosh, he, he already, he revealed that, but cryptically. So... There's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of 
I, you get a bigger kick out of it the second time through, I think, the first. But yeah, you said the love story, but it's a spy novel. There's the the Mossad and, and the um, the terrorism, and the, uh, but and then it's the philosophical realizations and. And just so, this man going through the stages of his life. We meet him when he's a child, and we go through well into his adulthood with him. So. There's the love story, there's the story of his life, there's the, the intrigue. But every character, without exception, every character develops. They start at one place and come to another. And they come to another because of the constant um, visual of what Thornton is doing. He, what he's doing is having an effect. And now that comes kind of full circle where it's like, hopefully the reader goes... Not, you know, I could be Thornton Klein, but metaphorically, like, I can get up this morning and go, I'm going to volunteer my time at the Eden Valley Library, and that would be a good thing. <laughs> or they could go, I'm going to shoplift a pair of sunglasses today. Bad you didn't <laughs> I did not shoplift it. But, uh, but the, it's, and then, like, well, uh, back to my song lyrics and stuff, one of the lyrics I was writing was, I know how it feels to lie to people you trust. It hurts. Because if you respect someone and then you let them down, it, it's, it, it's painful. And when you don't respect someone and they're belittle, belittling you because you're stupid and lazy or whatever it is, but you don't respect them, their words don't, they have no effect at all. So, when you are that example, and you're that pebble thrown into a pond, rippling out to affect everyone around you, you that's that's the idea of of the book, and the book is my pebble. <laughs> so it's it's just an idea that it'd be interesting as a an experiment to see if good things happen because of it. Hopefully. Well, don't you think it's like that listing of um, what I learned in kindergarten? <laughs> well, it comes back to those really simple values. Simple values. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This, all this, I think you guys, for, for you people, <laughs> can't call women guys. I was in you guys. But um, everyone, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this, this opportunity to, to present it. If anyone is interested, um, I, I'm gonna, I'm selling books for a uh, half price. It's ten dollars per book, if you like. Um, but and do you have a pen handy so that you can sign your oh, books? Um, we can fix that. Yeah. <laughs> what, book signing is it where you don't have a pen? <laughs> Please stop for refreshments, and then also sign up and put your name in the little box to um, win a prize, which is the Prize of Solomon.